your might come in your power speak forth let your name alone be glorified let your name be glorified father we worship you we give you praise in the name of jesus amen let us welcome the choir Praise the Lord. Let's just lift up our hands and begin to exhil as of the name of the Lord. Lift up your voice and begin to worship Him. Father, we exalt you. Gracious one, we worship you. Excellent one, we lift up our voice to you. Glorious one, we acknowledge your presence here. Greatest Lord, we bow before you. We honor you. Oh, we magnify your name. Nobody like you. No foreign God can take your place. You are God and you are King. We exalt you in this place. We magnify your name. Hallelujah. 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 We worship you. We worship you. The worship belongs to you. That's the only thing we can give to you. That's the only thing we can give to you. That's the only thing. And so, Father, we pour out our praise to you this morning. We pour out our worship this morning to you because you're worthy. Only you are worthy. Only you are worthy. Yes. Only you are worthy. Somebody bless him this morning. Only you are worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. He wants to hear your voice this morning. You're worthy.
worship it. If you believe there's none like our God, just lift up your voice and worship. Oh, we worship you. We exalt you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Such a pleasure to be here today. Praise God. Let's have a seat. Amen. Praise God. I remember these meetings. I remember, you know, faith seminar. Faith seminar. Praise God. I mean, I started going for faith seminar from, you know, listening to Pastor Forty. years now? 18, yeah? 2005, thereabouts. Faith Seminar. And then we'll pack Muson Center. And then, you know, I heard things, I heard words that I'd never heard before. I mean, it's still the same scripture. Praise God. Same scripture, but the practicality of it, how pragmatic and how it directly applied to my life was new, was different. Praise God. And, and that's why Pastor, I mean, I remember Pastor saying sometime this week, they are prophetic meetings. And what does it mean when you say a meeting is prophetic? It's not that, you know, somebody's going to be like, oh, thus said the Lord, thus said the Lord. You know, that's, that's our understanding of what prophetic is. It is that you go, you're going through something, and the man of God is just preaching, gives an example, all right? And that particular thing strikes you, all right? It's your, you know, bang, that's the answer. Amen, praise God. So it's not like, you know, you're going to be like, oh, you're going to hear one mighty wind, and everybody's going to be like, oh and all those kind of things. No, it's about you understanding that it's the word. The word is going to come to you. It will meet you at your point of need. Praise God. The Bible says the word of God is living and it is active. It's not dead. Praise God. This word that is in this scripture is not dead. Praise the Lord. It's written for yesterday, today, and for a thousand years to come if Jesus tarries. Praise God. That's what the Bible is about. So it is new every day. Amen. So when God wrote the Bible, or when God asked people to write the scriptures, he, he wrote them. But what he did is he layered, you know, thousands of years upon every verse. Praise God. 
Hallelujah. For example, in verse 17, verse, um, Acts chapter 17, verse 6, it says, And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down have come here also. Praise God. What they meant to say, these who have turned the world right side up have come here also. Praise God. Praise God. And I believe that that's where you are here. You are here because this is this meetings. They turn the world right side up. Praise God. Men, we have lived so much in our flesh, going by the deeds of our flesh and our senses. But we need to go by the spirit. Praise God. And it's about understanding how faith works. All right, leading by faith and your body follows. Praise God. And that is what these meetings have been. And that's what this meeting is about. It's about you understanding, leading by faith, praise God, leading by your spirit. Amen. 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 So just welcome somebody to your left and to your right and say, and just tell them, get ready for the word. Get ready for the word. Get ready for the word. Don't miss it. Get ready for the word. Don't miss it. Get ready for the word. Don't miss it. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible says that call upon Lord when he's near. It doesn't mean that God is far. But there are certain times that the word is closest to you. Amen. And at that point, catch it. My friend used to say the word, I mean, I learned not to speak Greek words in, in church, but you lambano it. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. You catch it. When the rep comes for you, don't, don't look at it and just be like, eh, that's not the time to go to the bathroom. That's not the time to check, you know, what are they saying you know, on WhatsApp, what are they saying on Instagram. It's about you being here. Praise God. Hallelujah. And to, you know, bring that prophetic word for us this morning, it gives me great pleasure as a pastor of the Covenant Nation Central London, to invite the visionary leader of the Covenant Nation, my pastor, your pastor. Please give me a round of applause to Pastor Bojie Made. Well, let's just say, let's just say a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Thank you that we have this opportunity to share your word this morning. Thank you for the presence of your spirit in this place. I ask by the power of your spirit who is here to glorify Jesus that you grant utterance that I speak as your oracle that your word goes forth in simplicity but with accuracy and power that our hearts be established in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may all be seated. I hope it's not everybody I'm seeing that has relocated. <laughs> they know themselves. They know what they know what they know. All right. <laughs> Welcome this morning. Have you, 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 you are still in this. You are going back. Ah, okay. Ah. <laughs> I say, take it, I take it, I take it. Just show you. <laughs> huh? You want me to go back? All right, uh, we're fine. All right, um, this morning it's a faith seminar, and um, I want to as, try as much as possible in the two sessions uh, to cover as much ground as is possible, all right, so that we have an entire package um, and workable understanding of faith. So I am going to say a few things, but I also am going to say several things with a few things. All right? In this first session, there are princip principally, there are two major points I want to bring out. But in the process of doing that, all right, there will be side discussions and I will say um, things as it's applicable uh, to every single person. Now, faith, first of all, we need to understand this, is based on the person of God. Who God is. Before we talk about the principles of faith, we must understand that, that faith is based on his person. And that we are putting our trust, not in principles, but we are putting our trust in a person. And that person, in response to our faith, will teach us and give us principles or show us laws through which what we have put our trust in him for will come to pass in our lives. But it is built on trust in a person. Uh, and so if that trust in that person is not there, which is cultivated through fellowship, then we can start, all right, teaching on the subject of faith. 
right? This is why faith is different, and we'll see this, from just principles of uh, positive thinking or positive affirmation. You are putting your trust in someone. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12 tells us, Paul was telling Timothy, he said, I know in whom, all right, uh, last part, I'm persuaded, for I know whom I have believed. And he said, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Now, if you look at it, naturally speaking here, uh, if you want to put money into someone's hand to keep for you, you are going to look at the person very well. You understand what I'm saying? And know that there is a trustworthy person that you can say with all certainty that I know whom I've given this money to, and I know this money is safe in the hands of this particular person. So it's not even about whether the person has a safe or whether a person has some sophisticated security system. It's whether the person, first of all, can be trusted. All right? You have to know the person. Is that person there first? And there's where a lot of times we miss it in the issue of faith uh, because there's, and we'll see as we teach here, there's a little leaven that leavens the entire lump. All right? And if that leaven is not there, you can have every other thing, the bread won't rise. All right? And we're going to say here. In other words, you go and read the books everybody reads. You learn everybody what everybody learned. You pray as long as they pray. You do what they said you should do. You confess as many times as they said you should confess, but the bread just doesn't rise. And so you are wondering that what is going on. Then we also see in John chapter 5, verse 39 and verse 40, Jesus said, search the scriptures. Well, don't make this mistake. For in them you think you have eternal life. John 5, 39 and 40. And he says, but they are they which testify of me. And he said, you will not come unto me that you might have life. So you don't get the life from the scriptures. You get the testimony of Jesus from the scriptures. And then you go to Jesus. And then Jesus now, that person imparts life unto you. So the scriptures on healing don't heal you. Jesus heals you. But the scriptures on healing tells you that Jesus is the healer. Do you get what I'm saying here? So you go to meet him. You without that interaction, connection with him, just like it was when he was on the earth. You, you couldn't, uh, nobody practice faith, you know, without going, coming, making contact with Jesus. All right? Is it that Jesus speak the word only? Lay your hands on my sick child, or, or I will touch the hem of your garment. There was some contact with the living person in order for it to happen. So, we're going to start our discourse here, and this is very important, on the person of God. And the fact that God is love and that God is good. Uh, Dr. Robert used to say this, uh, you know, and, and sometimes you just hear people say it, you wonder why they keep repeating it. And they will keep saying, God is a good God. Uh, God is love. That's who he is. God is not wisdom. He has wisdom. God is not power. He has power. But who is God? God himself is law. And the foundation of our faith, all right, which is our trust in him, is that God is a good God. Let me say this here. It might startle you a bit, but I'll show from the scriptures. The foundation of faith is not God's ability. The foundation of faith is God's goodness. Let me give it here. If faith is putting your trust, now after his goodness, we'll talk about his ability. But the first thing is God is good. Now, if they tell, if somebody is in need of, let's say, 5,000 pounds, and there are five people he or she knows have a million pounds. Now, who is that person going to approach? It's going to approach the person that they have heard is kind. In fact, you may decide not to approach somebody with ability haven't heard about the person's personality. 
So the fact that somebody has it doesn't give you any inclination that this person is going to give you unless people start telling you about the goodness of that person. So the foundation of it, right? So when we meet with people and this is the point said, look, and someone says, I'm telling you, God is able to do this. That person hasn't gotten it right yet. It has to be God is yearning to do this for me. God is willing to do this. Because you don't have to be a Christian to know that God is able. Creation shows us that God has ability. In fact, that's where the problem is, we'll see here. Because everybody talks about God's ability and God's ability. And people will argue. And let me show where the problem is now. If, if I take someone now to meet a sick person and I, and I say this, I look at this person. What is it? The person has cancer. Cancer. Cancer, yes. God can't heal this person. He doesn't have the power to do this. Argument will start. World War will start. What do you mean by God can't? I'm telling you, God can't do it. What do you mean God can't do it? Oh my God, oh my God. This person needs. What do you want to be? I want to be a millionaire when? In 12 months. God can't. God doesn't have the ability to do it. What do you mean God doesn't have the ability? I'm telling you that God, um, God is going to, God has the ability. I will, listen to me. I will put down my right hand. My God is able. Okay. So, are you going to be a millionaire in 12 months? Well, now, what, what do you mean? You mean, you know God is able, but you're not sure. Can God heal this man? Because of course. I'm telling you, he cannot. No, he can. I'm going to tell you. God. All right. So, is he going back home with you? Well, uh, well, what is well about? Well, you know, uh, well, we're not sure whether it is his will. In other words, what we're saying is he is not favorably disposed to using that ability to save a suffering person. Now, the revelation that Jesus brought of God to humanity was that he's a father. Nobody, Abraham, nobody called God father. Now, we leave that name and try to be impressive by using the Jew names in Judaism so that we'll sound deep. Jehovah Rufaga, Jehovah Sikin, Jehovah, we say Jehovah. The one Jesus brought, Father, it's too simple for us. We want to sound deep. But when Jesus came, why did he get into trouble? He said, my father, who is your father? How dare you call Jehovah your father? He told us, when you pray, say, and use this name, our father. Nobody ever prayed that. I said, father. Our father who art in heaven. Now, so Satan is attacking the fatherhood of God because that's the basis of prayer. Now, what do you mean by the fatherhood of God is what I'm saying. All right? That a person has ability doesn't paint the picture of a father. Because if you went out of this hotel and saw some children poorly dressed and they were eating out of the dustbin, all right, and you said, and then they told you that, you know, their father is the richest man in this area. You say, what do you mean? Their father has such ability and they are in this condition? Then it must mean that that man is wicked. Because I don't know what these children will have done to punish them this way. Now, so when you exalt the ability of a person over and above the willingness of that person to use that ability, you are destroying the fatherhood of that person. And this was Satan won. So when we shout, God is able to do it, Satan says, we are on good ground. Provided you don't know that he's yearning. And if we show from the scriptures that he's yearning and has the ability, then what I want to conclude is, What's keeping him from doing? You know something I learned about leadership? A leader wants results more than any other person in an organization. But the humbling fact is that the greatest obstacle to what that organization needs is, is the leader. The fact that you desire something doesn't mean you are not a hindrance to it. So you may want something from God but actually, you are programmed totally different. And therefore, 
there is self-sabotage that is going on. All right? You are not in alignment with it. I mean, the Bible tells us, this is why we now get into principles. He said, listen, a bad person who is double-minded, let not that person think. Not that God won't give, but he shall do what? Receive anything of the Lord. So, Psalm 34 and verse 8 tells us about the goodness of God. So faith is inspired, not just by what God can do, because we all know God can do it, but faith gets inspired in the hearts of people where you know that God is what? Willing to do it. So the fact that I know the man across the road has the ability to fund my business doesn't get me excited. Until I meet with the person and the person shows eagerness and is so interested in business and said, listen, by Monday I'm going to get it. Come. You know what happens? You leave that place. You're a changed person. The eagerness of that person to use that ability on your behalf. It's simple, but that's where the problem has started. So Psalm 34, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed uh, is the man that trusted in who? In him, because he is what? Good. And that what you are going to experience is the goodness of God, which means goodness means he is favorably disposed towards showing favor. Okay? So people are trying to inspire faith in others. And just listen to people well. And, and we want to address this today. Uh, just hold the conversation with somebody and just say, okay, so why do you think that this thing, and the person is talking about God's ability to do it, God's ability to do it. That person's mind has not yet been removed. Because everybody is but he starts saying about God's willingness, God's eager, that his person to use this power on my behalf. And once that change can be made within, I want to show this today, then we're on the path to getting things all right done. Uh, this is why the glory cloud, and this is so important. And let, let me say this to you. If you are in any form of a desperate situation, even if you are not now, if you ever get into any situation where things look like, it looks like God has left you. It looks like when we say God has left you, not that he has left you, but it does what? Looks like. Because when God is closest, it always looks like he has just departed. That, that's the truth about it. All right, that's the test. When God is closest, it looks like, all right, he has. And when you say, why hast thou forsaken me? Then that's the trouble. But if you get into any situation or you are faced with something that others say will destroy you. Sing to God a song about not your love for him, his love for you. You, you understand what I'm saying? It cannot be denied. That's why he says that we are accounted as sheep for slaughter. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors, not through our love for him, but through his love. All right? Which means the love that he has for us in Christ Jesus. Now, so let me show this and then I'll show this. Um, Psalm 22. Let me just show this here about Psalm 22 verse 1. All right. My God, people always say this. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. So look at what he says. It wasn't a failure of prayer. Because he was praying. Verse 2. He says, Oh my God, I cry. That's praying there. In daytime, thou hearest not. And in the night season, I am not silent. So this is a prayerful person. That's why I said we'll say a lot in the few things we'll say. All right? You just go listen to this and look for, if you see anybody who is really prayerful and they're not getting results, just sit down and watch their countenance. Are they happy? And are they forgiven? This is 
Just look at the guy. If, if you know, they have this, uh, look, I've been praying. I've been praying. Many intercessors, someone, some guys say, how come intercessors have so many problems? Because they are sad. All right? Because, you know, an intercessor can become judgmental. Sense of superiority over the rest of people. <laughs> we are the intercessors. I, mean, I had a friend in this city many years ago, and there was um, I mean, a group of them in the intercessory team of the church were, were my friends. And one day they were telling me, and I shook my head. I said, You people, hmm? right. He said, You know, we just go in, we are the intercessors, we pray before the service starts. And then when the pastor is coming, we just quickly slip back from the back of the door and then go because we don't want them to know that we are the ones who prayed the glory. <laughs> I mean, you start going into all this. People are sad. Okay? A, a lot of people, that, they are very sad. Okay? They are judgmental. I mean, I'm not saying you should do this, but it's just a very good example. Kenneth Hagin said the family he knew when he was pastoring that God most blessed. And that this family, that you, you won't see them, I'm not saying you should do this, but you won't see them in church for a month, they just suddenly come. And then you see them again. Five weeks and they'll come. But they were so blessed because when it's time for worship, Praise. These people only come once, twice, and the whole family start dancing to the front of the church. They will dance around, they will dance around, they will dance around, you know. And you know, that is a test for the congregation because we don't see you. Now, <laughs> they start, you are the ones that now become the champions of dancing. You that we are not going to see. Even the pastor can enter into a judgmental spirit. They said they will dance, they will hug everybody, and they will dance. And they will come with testimonies. He said, but he noted. You know, when those people attend testimonies, you don't believe that testimonies. But you noticed that they were always joyful and quick to forgive. You can't offend them. Are you understood? I mean, I used to be a military man coming to church. In other words, I come at the end of worship with my. What are you coming to to, to write the war? All right? We are the serious people in church. What? We're here for what? For the war. Well, for what? The war. Taking in the world without joy. Is eating food without water. You soon behold. As faith without work, the word without joy. I can't remember his name now. Something there. Great teacher of it. He said the secret to prevailing prayer is triumphant faith. And the secret to triumphant faith is persistent prayer. So, verse 2. It says, Psalm 22, verse 2. He said, I cried unto thee, all right, in the daytime and in thy harass not, in the night season I am not silent. He says, why have you not shown up? And God told him why in verse 3. He said, I found out. For thou art holy, O thou that inhabited the praises of Israel. In other words, if you don't start with praise, and you are not a person of praise, don't bother. Yeah, what I said? Because he has to inhabit presence. That word inhabit means his manifest presence. Now, God is present everywhere. But when you see his manifest presence, which means his visible presence, in other words, when he says, why have thou forsaken me? God does not forsake. But you don't see that visible presence where there's no joy. So probably if you check the person's life, something happened that got that person hurt and offended. And once they got hot and offended, they didn't step into joy first before they started praying. That's why James and Peter said, count it all joy. Come and inhabit the praises. So he said, I get it now. That's why we also see in Isaiah 49. Let's just quickly look. I wasn't going to do this actually. Look at Isaiah 49 verse 8 or verse 11. Let me see this. 
Isaiah 49, which is going to show the same thing. All right. All right, verse 13, sorry. It says, sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy on his afflicted. But Zion said, the Lord has what? Forsaken me. When there's no praise, it looks like there's no praise. Then God told him in the next verse, he said, can a woman forsake, all right, a shocking child that should not have compassion on soul? He says, they may forget, but I cannot. In fact, he told him, lift up your eyes. He said, everything is coming towards you when you are saying God has forsaken. So, about God's goodness, listen, when you think that God hasn't been good, is when you should think about his goodness. That's what will irritate Satan. Because what he wants you to think is that God doesn't love you. That, because if he gets that, he knows that you say God is able, oh, you think about his power. He knows. All right? So, in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13, when the glory cloud came down, all right, first time there, what was the song? And the song is so important. In 2 Chronicles chapter 5, and verse 13, the Bible tells us, all right, it says, and it came to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard. So, a sound has to come out of your heart. You, you must, a sound must be heard in heaven, all right? It says there was a sound that was heard in praising and thanking God. And when they lifted up their voice, all right, the trumpets and the cymbals and, let's go on here, it says trumpet, cymbals, all right, and instruments of music and praised the Lord saying, the content is so important. That's why he says he gave in me a what? New song. The content is so important. Saying, this is what they were saying, for he is good and his mercy endureth, which means he is favorably disposed to show him favors. That then, when they did what? Sang, that he is good and his mercy endureth. It was then that the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of God. So now, if that song was not sung there, then there will be no manifestation. And when there's no manifestation, then you see God has forsaken. You see? Understand? And I said this several times. When the first time I met Dom, when I asked, I said this one question I want to ask you. I said, what's the question? I said, how was it that you discovered that? You discovered how to slaughter. You discovered that you discovered this refuge. How did you discover all these people and knew that these people were going to turn things around? He said, he said, very easy. He said, I wasn't looking, listening for great musicians. I was looking for churches where there was a move of the spirit. Because I knew that wherever there's a move of the spirit, the songs are right. He said, so, once I heard something was happening in Hillsong, Australia, I boarded the flight. And I sat at the back of the congregation. And I started watching. And I saw the lady come out. And she started singing. I listened to the content of the word. I knew that's where the move was. When, the Bible says when, which means, if I say I came to your house yesterday, ah, I didn't see you, what time? When did you come? Which means, at what time did you knock on my door? So if you ask, when did the cloud come? When they Go and look at Jehoshaphat. When they surrounded him was when he sang, the mercy of the Lord endureth forever. In other words, when you think that God, what have I done? That's when you should sing. He is good and his what? Mercy endureth forever. The Bible says, when and as they began to sing, God said, um, when? At what time? That's why it's hard for people to Take it in because we are used to works. When I say works, now to labor. Huh? So I asked Pastor Lebo, I said, What's your sick? I know if you want to know a person's, why a person gets results on the outside, you find out what they are doing that you don't see. Anything that you see is not a secret. 
not a secret. Okay? Because God that seeth in secret rewards what? Openly. So any open reward is based on something God alone saw in secret. Do you get what I'm saying? So if all of us are praying, now you we, listen to this. You can't pray in, in I mean, we'll know if you're a person of prayer. Like your neighbors will know, you, the people will know that you pray. So you, 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 there's that one. No, no, I'm trying to say something. The secret part, the secrecy there is the content of the prayer. In other words, public worship is not the same as private worship. Paul taught that. He taught that. He said, when I am in private, I speak in tongues more than you all. But when I'm in public, I have to use words easy for everybody to do what? Understand. In other words, you can only sing what everybody understands. So if all that the people will understand is Jesus is here, 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 then we sing Jesus is here, here, here. Because any other thing, we are going above people's heads. But when you are in private, then your songs cannot be public songs. You get what I'm saying? Because that's when you're personally expressing things, building songs out of those things, and worshiping God in that way. So quickly, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 3, going to this. So sing about his goodness, all right? Okay, 2 Chronicles 7, 3. Okay, it says the next thing. It says, and when the children of Israel saw how the fire came down, the glory and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worship. And praise God, saying, for his word, good. And his mercy endureth forever. That's why when you're walking through the shadow of the valley of death, what are you saying? Goodness and what? Mercy. So when you are in that valley, you should be singing about his goodness and mercy. That's why it followed you. Do you see? That's why the thing was coming, because those angels followed you, because that's the content of what. So don't forget this. Because what Satan wants is for you to start saying, look at what's happened. You are murmuring, you are complaining, but to understand that God is good and his mercy endureth forever. Everybody will remain. This is true. In a state of rest or uniform motion in a straight line, except compelled an external force to act the And when that external force comes, it doesn't look, it doesn't feel good. But you've got to say, God is what? Good. And his what? Mercy. Endure it forever. And so you go there and you embrace him and you worship him. So there is an attack, we said this, on the fatherhood of God. Because a father will rather have a child doubt their ability rather than their willingness. In other words, it's better for the child to say, if my father just had the ability to buy this, I know his heart, he will have done it. All right? Than to say that this man. <laughs> now, the concept that Satan is trying to paint is this God. That why do you pray? You pray. So why do you spend so long in prayer? To overcome the reluctance in God. You know, that's what really people are saying. That's importunity. What's happening? We're overcoming the reluctance. That God, 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 all right? So why do you fast? Maybe after I fast and I don't eat, he will have pity. <laughs> so what's the opportunity in prayer? To overcome demonic resistance to it. You know what I'm saying? In other words, that's why he says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, he says, he says, now, Revelation 12, all right, 11. It says now, sorry, verse 10, rather. It says, now is come, all right, the kingdom, Revelation 12, 10. And I heard a voice, loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation. One translation says, at long last, 
salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. He says, for the what? Accuser of the brethren is what? Cast down. Okay? In the second session, I'll show this about, about, about praise being the gates into your life. And when there's no praise, your gates into your life are shut. Nothing can come. Nothing you are praying about can come once the gates are closed. The delivery man can come to your door, but it's closed. So it's an attack on his fatherhood. A father would rather have a child doubt his ability than his willingness. Which is his willingness to use his ability to bless. So God being good means that God is willing. And I'm saying this, that God is more willing to help you than you want to get help. Let me repeat. God is more willing to heal a sick person than the sick person wants healing. That sick person just wants relief from pain. God wants not just relief from pain, but release into something that person doesn't even know. God in heaven's investment will be cut short. Do you get what I'm saying? More than the person thinks. You know, you know, you, you know, you, you, can, you, can, you can hear prosperity message for 20 years, 30 years. But actually, you still don't think. No, 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 no. You don't say God wants us to prosper. God wants us to prosper. All right, but, but subconsciously, you, you still, you, you know, I always thought business people weren't serious people. Okay? They weren't serious business people. Why? All right? A subconscious program. Because when we're in school, then and they say you need to fill jam form. You know the right people. It's only a lawyer, a doctor. No businessman is allowed to, you know, to sign the form. So what does that tell you as a child? They're not dependable, <laughs> they're not serious. <laughs> so when someone says back then you're an entrepreneur. This is a hustler. All right. Until I realized that there is science in business. Not just hustle. So you may just think, you know, it's God that gives power to get wealth. That I may establish. So, you know, you just until one day I saw, I'll get to the scripture, I saw why he gives power. And I said, my goodness, may money come. Because without it, Without it, let me repeat, without it, without it, your dream would only be nightmare. Except you don't have a dream. Huh? I mean, he, re he actually told them, the only way I can multiply churches on this earth, to fill the entire earth, is they must have the money to It became clear in my country. It, became, it dawned on me. You can't tell me, you know, you can't come and tell me now that I, it's clear. Something has changed. All the things, it has something in me changed. Without it, All right. So there's an attack on his fatherhood as one who is reluctant. To use his power. Now, once you think of him as being reluctant, then you approach him in that way, then what's going to happen is you're going to have a problem connecting with him. All right? Now, let's look at two examples in scriptures here. Proverbs 3 and verse 27. All right? This is what God said that we should never do. So let's see how welcome he's the one who is now doing. Do not withhold good from those who deserve it or to whom it is due when it is in the power of your hand to do what? Do it. Do you see what he said? No, sir. Now, if you say God has the power to do it, he says, don't withhold good from them to whom it's due. You say, well, is it due unto me? Well, Jesus paid with his blood. The Bible calls it the 
the redemption of the purchased possession. It was paid for by the blood of Jesus. So it's due unto his children. He says, don't withhold good from them to whom it's due when it is in the power of your hand to do it. Now, some say, well, God can just delay. You know, we just say it's God. You know, I'm, you know you can't, don't preach from experience. Preach from the Bible. Show me where somebody went. Uh, God, God just sat in heaven and said, we will just delay this thing. And then we use catchphrases to explain away our failures. Uh, uh, like I was in school once, and somebody came to meet me. It was the Holy Ghost that gave me wisdom. I, I said, so what's up? What's good? I was praying on fellowship. I said, no, I'm ministry. You know, we're very smart. So why are you very smart? He said, no, the person said, you know, we know how to You know, we have a John the Baptist. We, we preach repentance. All the churches don't preach repentance. I said, but John the Baptist has come. In fact, his disciples went to meet Jesus to say the multitudes are leaving us and they are going to meet Jesus. So he had multitudes when he was preaching repentance. So it's either you are not sent or you are not preaching the real repentance. Because he was a bad, he wasn't user friendly. <laughs> he did not welcome first timers very well. Because when they came, he said, Who told you this first timers? The soldiers came and said, You are. You, Jerry, who told you that you should come? They said, listen, John, pastor, leave it. Say what we must do. Leave all that what you are saying. We know what we have done. That's why we have come. He said, and you too, you've come? Can you imagine? You are the pastor preaching. You will cringe. But the multitudes kept coming. So sometimes people take their experience and fit it into scripture. Instead of taking scripture to fit into the experience. And that's why we're very careful when people want to justify something and say, well, you know, so this happens, so and this happens, so and this happens, and then there's no Bible. Because many things can happen. Satan can be transformed into an angel of light. When we just got saved, there was a woman back there. She would tell Susan. It was going everywhere, telling testimonies. And it was about demonic testimonies. She was a high-ranking person in the occult. And when she comes to church, everybody would be scared. And then she'll tell them us about how they would do this and this. And now start instructing us on how to pray. That look, we used to go there at night and do this. So you people wake up at night, everybody to say, Yeah, we wake up at night. There, no Bible. Just they were, so what the leader of fellowship back there just got up. He said, Listen, you people be careful because Satan is part of life. If you were in his kingdom, he was telling you life. So it says, do not withhold good from them. It's in the power of the hand to do it. Next verse, verse 28, it says, do not say to your neighbor, go and come back, and tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. So the question is, does God have it with him? Yes. yes. Does he have the power to do it? Yes. That means God is saying, come once in prayer. Stay in prayer until you get it. And go back. He would not say go and come back. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 19 tells us about the exceeding greatness of his power. I'm building this up so that people, there's a inner past because we're, we're, we're in warfare now, fighting subconscious program. That you may just not even know is there. All right? Subconscious programming that you may not just know is there. Ephesians 1 says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? Well, he didn't just leave that word. He says, To us, word. All right? Or towards us. Which means he only uses that power when he's using it for us. Do you get what he's saying? It's a power that is released when he's using it. That's why. The psalmist said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? That when I look at the stars, he uses his power, but he says, I've reserved something. And the only way you will ever see the exceeding greatness of that power is when I'm using it on, through my child. To get something done. That's why the eyes of the Lord are going to and through the entire earth. Which means he's hunting for where he can pour this thing. 
He says, a person whose heart is what? Perfect. Which means there's something in the heart that is limiting him. And that's the second slide I want to show. And how to get rid of that. And I, I, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I can start talking. Big, but I don't want anybody to leave. I don't, listen, listen to what I'm saying. And I want you, this seminar here, to, after I finish teaching this, to test God. Now, I'll show you what I mean. You write something down that you want God to do. No, listen to me. I'm not saying it should be deep. I want to win 100 souls. That's what I'm saying. Don't, 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 don't be deep here. That is, you will know that God loves you. Do you get what I'm saying? Don't start being deep. You will know that if you want to teach me, I'll come back and teach me. But that you will know because many people are preaching about a God who they've not experienced his love. Like somebody was preaching to someone, the guy said, you don't sound convinced. When you are convinced, come back. <laughs> you don't sound convinced. Now when you are convinced, come back and tell me about it. Because anybody who has experienced that law. So, anything in which God will not violate his moral government in getting it done for you. In other words, you're not asking to steal. You're not asking to... Well, well, let me, let's, just, let's not be deep with moral government. Let's just make it this way. You are not asking him to deprive anybody of anything that rightfully belongs to them to get it to you. Because if you look at the whole of the Ten Commandments, self, you will see that there are commandments of love. Thou shalt not. He was saying, don't deprive somebody else. Outside of you worship me and making your source, the rest is thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit murder. Don't deprive. Thou shalt not covet. He's talking about depriving somebody else. So it's the exceeding greatness of his power towards what? So let's look at some examples here. So we see where the problem lies. People knew that God can. God is able. But whether God is willing. You understand? I mean, I've said he's going to meet you. You know he is able to help in your business. But if he's now excited, then, then you know now I am in business. Mark. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 2. And this has always been the problem. Okay? Matthew chapter 8 and verse 2. All right? So, now, now the reason why this is going to be with this that, listen, listen. Once you know, listen, once you know God loves you and you are anchored in that love, when things apparently are going wrong, you know they are apparently going right. Do you get what I'm saying? See, I am sure, without word of knowledge, or any descent of spirit, you, nobody under this auditorium, has committed both things of, of, of David. You have not committed adultery and murder again. You won't be here if you've done it. Okay? David committed murder, killed the man, and did that. But David knew that in the midst of this, and God judged him. And after God judged him, David still said, listen, among everybody on this earth, the person who loved me is God. I went back to God. Do you get what I'm saying? And out of that union, which there is no counselor or pastor, if you come and meet anybody dripping with the Holy Ghost, what they're going to tell you is, what happened? The child died. Now, so what should I do? First thing, as far as the east is from the west. Separate yourself from this woman. Let her go, you go. Now, I will also advise you that since you killed her husband, now you should make sure you pay the rent, you, you do these things. Are, are, are you following what I'm saying here? But David went back to where God just judged. And Solomon came up. Now, you know the serious thing here? Imagine David without Solomon. Adonijah, Absalom, from error, came out of accuracy. This is what you caused by your own self. God still brought destiny out. What are you talking about? It's your mouth that's causing the problem. 
I'm finished. I'm dead. I'm fi-. This what is causing the problem. David never said I'm finished. In fact, the people are saying he's finished. He said, I'm not finished. <laughs> because after he finished, he dressed up, changed his raiment. It's you that are finished. I am okay. Watch them. Can you imagine that kind of person? That's like that family that came dancing. No sense of guilt. You didn't come for the huh? We didn't come. <laughs> that doesn't stop us from dancing. That's your problem. It's not my own problem. Say, why didn't you come? That's your problem. <laughs> I hate that's my problem. He, they took and danced. Same thing with what we call the prodigal son. So much to learn from him. I've told you, many people have the elder brother spirit. They say, all these years I've served you. God. God. No conventional priest. Yet, there are many people in God's vineyard that are like that. No job. The younger brother came back. They threw a party. He didn't tell his father, don't waste money. There was no sense of guilt. He entered the party. Can you imagine? He was dancing. The servants came. No, no, no. You know how I like my drinks. <laughs> Do you know how annoying? <laughs> how annoying? Don't change that. Change. I mean, the other one, I'll just sit down. This boy. <laughs> so I'm trying to tell you that God's love is, is not based on you. It's based on him. The Bible says he is kind to the unthankful. I'm telling you that we don't believe he's kind. That's the problem. It's not good, though. It's not good. But I respect Nigerian politicians. It's not good. But let me tell you why I respect them. They will rig an election and go for Thanksgiving service. <laughs> you rigged this election. I know. You know. There's a man that is a governor. His opposition said, I have told him three times, you're a Christian. You are here for Thanksgiving. Hold the Bible on your chest and say, you won this election in 2011. And just hold the Bible. He said, he cannot. <laughs> but the man was doing Thanksgiving. If you go and ask him, you know what to say? He said that if God didn't want us to win, even religion won't work. That's what he did. <laughs> God will have taken my breath. I will have collapsed before you. That's what he was going to tell you. But we that God does things for. Do you know? Let me tell you this. Don't have my message. Some of the issues that you have inside your life now, I'm just saying this by word of knowledge, will be resolved by no confession, no prayer, just thanking God for the things he has done in your past. Finish. The problem is lack of thanksgiving. And let me just tell you here. We cannot outdo Jesus. If Jesus healed 10 and only one came back, only 10% of blessed people come back. Don't try to change that number. Just be, say, just make up your mind. I'm not trying to make anybody else be thankful. I'm just going to thank him. Just remember that number. I said this, Pastor Adipo, I was going to say this about secret of prayer. So I said, I said, so what's the secret of prayer? And let me tell you why. It's, it's, on, it's on YouTube. They told me when it was 80, right? It was 80. They told me, the people in charge of it, that they said to me, they, they, they said to me, they said, it is only your interview. People have interviewed Pastor Debe over the year. But on his birthday, it was your interview with him. We transcribed into the magazine that we gave everybody. He said, the reason is you asked provocative questions. In fact, what happened was that I sent him 13. He said, your questions can write a book. I can't answer this 13 or 14. Choose, because people ask me, why you just limit to seven? He told me, choose seven. And I will answer them. 
So I want to look at it, and that's why. Because if you have all the time to ask, you will ask nonsense. If they tell you, you have 10 minutes, you will go deep. You will take the 13, take two together, and ask as one. <laughs> So I crunched it. And when I asked him, so how do you pray? He looked. 95% of my prayer is Thanksgiving. Hard for us to accept. We like labor. And you must remember when when those people, when the, the, Jesus himself said, ah, why they not tell? He knows. Only one kid. The word he used was thou art cleansed. When they got healed. When no one came back, he said thou art whole. You know, when you have leprosy, they separate you from You lose your family, you lose your business, you lose everything. So when he cleansed them, you can go back to start all over again. When he said you are whole, he restored everything. So God does one blessing, you come back with gratitude, then more comes in. All right, so let me go on with this. So, quickly, Matthew chapter 8 here to show his willingness to use this power. Matthew 8, verse 2, sorry. All right, Matthew 8. And behold, there came a leper, look at what he said, and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou what? Will. Thou can do what? Can. In other words, you are able, but the if is. I don't think you are willing. Do you see what the problem is? Now, when you say God is able, it looks like, but say, we see if you are willing. You see, is it God's will? That has always been a problem with this thing. Is it God's will? People have been stuck on God's will for 30 years. Sinners have gone. Oh, will come and say, eh, I'm going to bakery. Is it God's will? What, what's your problem? Is it God's will? I want to sell shirts. Is it God's will? The sinner doesn't, he just goes. God will help me. <laughs> you, you are there saying, is it God's will? And now what the problem comes? You try to sell it to five people. It, it didn't sell. I don't think I'm in God's will. I don't think I'm in God's will. It's just like a baby trying to walk. You fall four times. I don't think I should walk. That's how we do because we are not anchored in His love. What do you mean? Is, is it God's will? May God not place you in power. It's not that you need. He starts you there. When your will doesn't come, that you are told what. So Joseph, when he got into Potiphar's house, would he say, is what he found he did. And the Bible says, whatever his hand taught prospered, for God was with him. And then they moved him to something else, management, and he did what? Prospered. Then they made him overseer of everything, and he did what? Prospered. Then they threw him into prison, and Joseph didn't doubt God's law. And the Bible says another set of job description was given to him there. He did what? Prospered. If you can't prosper at what you are told to do, you can't prosper at what you think you are sent to do. Why do we have many failed entrepreneurs? Because they think that the nine to five is a prison. So when I am liberated, you will see, you will see the genius in me. Let me tell you this. If you get late to your nine to five job, you will get late for every meeting as an entrepreneur. You will come later than your staff to work. You, you, do you get what I'm saying? Nothing will change. So people have to be taught that God is not just able, but he's willing. All right? So there has to be faith 
right, in God's compassion. Uh, the Bible tells us in Matthew 14, 13 and 14, it says, it says that um, uh, Jesus, all right, went about, and why was he doing it? He had compassion. Matthew 14, 13 and 14. It was compassion that he had for people. All right? And when Jesus heard it, he departed from by boat to a place. And when he saw the mult, and when the multitude they followed him afoot from the cities. And when Jesus saw, and when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude. And he was what? Moved by what? Compassion. In other words, what moved him was love. And compassion means you feel what the person is feeling. Uh, the Bible says, in all of our affliction, he is afflicted. Listen, what he's saying is that when you are going through something, God is going through it. When you feel a certain way, God also, you know, his touch is, is like, it's like, listen, when, this is what intercession is. When a mother, if a mother's child is sick and the child is crying and the child is in pain, the thought of the mother is, bring the pain on me that you can be free. That bring the pain on me. Let me, I will solve the problem. That's how God, when you are going through, that's how he feels. Now, now, if you're walking past and you see a, a couple and they're walking and you see something heavy on the legs of the child and, and, the, and they just walk past and they look and they just look past. And they say, those are their parents. And it's not possible. It is just not what? Possible. There is no way a parent will see even a normal person, except that person is callous, has a hardened heart. That you see a child cry and you will walk past. I, I hope you know the picture we're painting of God. That you are able, but you're walking past. And that he's not time sensitive. In, in other words, you just let you suffer. And the time will pass. The Bible says he is a ever present help. That's timing. In a time of what? Need. He says, come up to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in what? Time. In other words, it comes on time. Now, if the parents walk past, they say, that's the father and mother. You say, it's not possible. It is impossible for them not to be inclined towards helping that child. Now, it's the same way God. It is impossible that God. Now, but if the parents get there, now, and you, you sh should do this, father, trying to lift it up, but they cannot, it's too heavy. At least they have proven their love for the child. Now, God says, I'm not just compassionate, now I'm also able to do it. So, I will move there, but you can be sure I lift it. That's where the ability now comes in. After we know he's willing to use it. I'm telling you this. Listen, it's part of our work. Few people sing to God about how much he loves them. We sing to God how much we love him. Do you understand it? But we love him because he first loved us. Any love you have for him is what he deposited in you. If it's not that, it's fake. Just the one you want to buy. Oh, they're trying to get something. I love you. It's good talk. I love you. <laughs> Once you get it, you are gone. Or if you don't get it, then you are offended. Singapore is not. Singapore is, I will say it in times of death. Because when, listen, I mean, David understood this. One day I was meditating and I was preparing for a meeting. And it was like I heard God whisper, Miss David on the other side. He's somebody that gets into trouble, he will not complain. He will come and help. Too many people are complaining. But David, if it was in his day, there was massive hold up. He would start thanking God. There was no, he would say that, look at what's going on. Because you know something is wrong. He will know something is up. If something goes wrong, you say, listen, to, let's thank God. You don't know what the Father has on it. The lines will fall onto us in place and place. We will see that God is wiser than us. And you worship God. So, 
So the compassion of Jesus is what moved him to heal the sick and to raise the dead. To have compassion is to feel what the other feels. And then with your ability, you do something about it. So what then hinders him, which is the second part, from expressing this love? Right? There must be some massive hindrance. Because if he, if he does love us this much and he has that enormous power, then there has to be something all right, that is clogging this power all right, from flowing through. Because when Jesus was here physically, and he told us, he said, it's more expedient for you that I go away. In other words, you'll be better off without me being around. Now, Jesus will enter into places and every single person gets healed. Are you telling me all those people live right? Are you telling me there's no liars among them? You are telling me all those people? Without any discrimination. The Bible says, and he healed all. He went to a village and he will heal all. And there's nobody that came to Jesus, not that had the problem and walked past, but came to Jesus that Jesus didn't solve the problem. Let me see Jesus just one thing. Well, 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 the Father told me to tell you. Your own problem is deeper. Did you see him? Even the madman, yeah, everybody. You come to Jesus, that's it. You can see him, that's it. You, nobody. Let's go. In fact, you could even change your mind on terms of the method. Uh, the Roman centurion. I mean, think about it. You came to meet Jesus. They said he's built a synagogue. Send the elders to him. Jesus said, I'm going to his house. Jesus is going to your house. You let Jesus walk all that way. Then when he's about to get to the end, you say, well, I've seen something else. Jesus, you don't have to come. Speak the word. Only. Jesus did not say, why did you let me walk all this way? He, <laughs> he spoke the word he was done. The next person, Peter's mother-in-law, came to him and said, it was when he entered the house, Jesus didn't complain. He didn't say, you that you have been with me, didn't you see the centurion say, speak the word of me? What type of, what type of, what type of person are you? How, you know? Lay hands. Are you there? Somebody else said, come, he will follow you. The woman with the issue of blood said, if I will touch the hem of his garment, Peter would, Peter didn't know it. He was, they were saying, they touched, they got to Jesus didn't now stay and say, listen, from now on, anybody that wants anything, just will come and talk. I can't be walking around. Just stay where I am. Come and touch. Where is your faith? He didn't. I, I mean, Kenneth Hagin says this, and I like it. He says, you can't, I can't prove I'm right, but you can't prove I am wrong. So it's neutral. So I'm about to say something. You cannot prove I am wrong. Even though I cannot prove I'm right. But it is consistent with the spirit of scripture. But you can never prove me from the Bible. The Roman centurion defined the power in the context of his own life. Because he was a soldier. Nobody else could have understood it apart from a military person. So if you're a military person, he wants you to understand faith from your background. Not from somebody else's back. You agree with that one? I'm going to where you will agree. But <laughs> I'm building my case. So he said, I am a man under authority. I say. He said, right. So you cannot disprove what I'm about to tell you. That the Syrophoenician widow used to serve tables. You can't disprove it. You can't. Because the Roman centurion was a soldier. That woman used to serve tables. So she told Jesus, from my own understanding, when we are serving, crumbs come. Before you say, wow, wow, I have another one. <laughs> you cannot disprove that a woman with the issue of blood was a fashion designer. She used to make clothes. So she said, I will touch. That's how it is. Because when we come before the presence of God, the Bible says different tongues, tribe, call. You do it the way you understand. And 
That's why. One of the problems we had is, in fact, even in, in Africa, yeah, the ministries that really went big were the ministries that did not try to apply faith like Tulsa. They understood the principle of Tulsa and came back home. So those of you here have to do it as it is here. You are no longer in Nigeria. You better do it the way they do it here. You kiss the ground and say, I'm now in this country. Or else you limit how far you can go. Do you understand? So what then hinders? Let's look at the second part. All right? We've tried with the first part, have you? We can move on now. You believe God loves you. He wants to help. He wants to really, really want to help you. Yeah? So let's quickly get second part. So what's the problem? Proverbs 3, we saw this, 27, it says, Do not say, go and come again when you have it by who? By you. Withhold not good to him who is due. So if that is the case, then we combine that with 2 Peter 3, 9. God is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness. That means he is not slack. He is just not willing, but he is long-suffering. Do you know what long-suffering means? He is putting up with something in us that is irritating him. That thing is hindering him for doing what he wants to do. And you are doing it on repeat. And you know the issue? You don't know what it is. If you knew, you'll have changed. But it's, and I want to show you how to get to it, it's a blessing blocker. It's something that has been ingrained at subconscious levels that is sabotaging the manifesto. All right? Which means begins to sabotage it. So you're wired in a certain way that is totally different. So if, if you go meet people that, if, 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 I mean, if, if, I just don't know where I can find them. I don't know what I listen to. And they, and they said, look, they have studied, you can clone people according to the level where they are. That like if you go and take somebody who, is, who did legitimate business and is a billionaire in England, and you take a billionaire in South Africa, you take a billionaire, the same billions in dollars, that's what they're worth, all right, in Australia, billionaire in Brazil and you give them the same set of challenges, they will all act the same. Take somebody whose business is on a 50,000 level dollars there, give them the set of challenges, they will act the same. Give them massive problems, you will see that they will be calm. You move around there. Don't you have problems? I mean, my landlord back then, I mean, he, 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 I mean, in Lagos, he sold the whole of Antonia Estate. He owned it, sold everything. I mean, he took me back there. I mean, he showed me things when I, was, when, I was, when I met him. He took me to his house. He told me I was a serious Nigeria. I mean, see, I mean, when, when they did the coup of 1990, when they shot him, Dajman Obasanjo ran to his house. He told me, he said, it was in my house. Dajman was sitting over a table. He said, we sat in the dining table. If I take it, I will be killed. I don't want to get killed. I will shoot you now. If you don't declare yourself head of state, I will shoot you. All right? And I'll say, Jim took you. You are the head of state. By force. By what? Fire. And you make a head. I'm just trying to show you how some people have become. All right? Okay? Now, that's how powerful it is. One day we were walking, and somebody came to meet him. I said, sir, they say your own money, your own money. Ah, he told me, oh, money. So even the federal government owes money. <laughs> United States of America owes money. Is that a problem? Let's go where we're going. Who give me your money? He was free. Death didn't trouble him. I'm not saying she's going to go, but I'm just telling you <laughs> that. You may owe something and you can't sleep. 
These men take risks without their at rest. Risks that if you, they say, this risk they are taking, if it goes wrong, they can lose everything in one move. They will take it. You ask them why. They will tell you it will work. How do you know? Someone in church in Nigeria was getting married. Her uncle was bidding for a GSM license. They had canceled it with $200 million. This is back then. He was telling somebody they said, listen, I will get it. They said, but the government they said, leave what they said. I will get it. We call certainty. These people are not for confession, but the way they were saying it. If it's a Christian, you say, God is not with you. You aren't led from it. Because, because with the Christian, God leads me. Beside the still waters. He leads you. Makes you to lie down and dream that way. He leads you in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. This is God. But the Bible says, do I walk through? In other words, as he's leading you, he takes you through the valley of the shadow of death. God is there too. I hope you know what the valley of shadow is there. When you're in green pasture, you see everything green there. Valley of shadow of death. When you're walking through it, you see skulls and skeletons. This is where this person's business is. This is where they so what? He leads you. He's the same God. You have to be confident in the valley of the shadow of death. Say you have three weeks to the end. He said, wait. We'll be here after three weeks. You'll be wondering, how can you be calm in this crisis? How are you going to solve it? You know, there are two different people. There are people that when they're in crisis, are calling on Jesus. Jesus, save us. That's one level. Jesus, slay. There are people that pray. There are people that say, we are sleeping. Sleeping in the crisis is our act of faith. To show nothing can go wrong. But they are level. You can walk on water or you can cry, save me. Do you understand? One, you are like Jesus, which is where he wants to bring us. So you can read the scripture and you can be the Jesus healing the sick or you can be the lame man trying to get you. Do you understand what? Depends on the way you read the Bible. Some who are reading as a lame man, after some time they stop reading as a lame man. They now say, I must now be the Jesus healing. Do you understand what I say? About that? So it's not how do you how do I receive healings? How do I heal the sick? So it tells us it's not slack. But not willing that any should perish, but come towards repentance. So he's saying there's something that should change. There's something that should change. And the truth is, I'll show this, you don't know what that thing is. Now, if you knew, you'd have started going that direction. But you just don't know what to do. And, and the issue is that if you don't know you are doing anything wrong, then, 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 there will be no condemnation. There will be no sense of guilt. All right? So you're just going on. But you must remember there's a way that cement right onto it. The end thereof is there. In other words, if you go and meet the person, there's a way that cement right onto you. The end is there. What you bring life will first of all seem wrong to you. If they suggest it to you, say that. If they come and meet and say, no, do it this way. Nah, nah. Nah, nah, nah. nah, nah. It doesn't agree with me. I, I don't, I don't, I don't feel. Those who've been in school, they say that they are nowhere to be found now. I, I don't feel. I can't, I can't. <laughs> it just doesn't agree with myself. Uh, you know, come on, you hear it. But God had something they didn't know. Are you following me? So, Job chapter 34. 
Now, quickly, and verse 32, and this is what, this what, God, was, this is what God was saying, telling Job, uh, right, and Job, do you understand? He said, he said, Job, he told Job, he said, after Job was saying, no, I'm right, I'm right, and I was arguing with him, I'm right, I'm right, I didn't do anything wrong. He said, this is what you should have said. Teach me what I do not see. If I've done iniquity, I will do no more. Now, now listen to this. Listen to this, quickly, because of time. You know, Jesus is your high priest at the right hand of the Father. He's called a faithful. You know what faithfulness means? Faithful is he that promised. So he's faithful to help in the fulfillment of what he has promised. But the Bible says he's a compassionate. Not just faithful, but he's what? Compassionate. Now, what's he compassionate about? Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 2. He says that he might have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way. In other words, you are ignorant of something. And because that on those who are ignorant and going astray, which means your ignorance is taking you away from the path. Now, when he got to the right hand, what did he do? He sent his spirit. What does the spirit do? The first thing he said, he will teach you. In other words, the spirit has come to cure you of that ignorance. So, when Jesus taught, he said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, he said, how much more won't the Father give the who? The Holy Spirit. In other words, when you pray for something, he gives you the spirit for the fulfillment of it. He doesn't have money, he doesn't have jobs. He pours what he has into you. Now, when the spirit comes into you, he starts teaching you how to do it. But we are waiting on the outside. This is why we are missing it. When he is doing it on the inside, See what it says here. Psalm 25, verse 10. I'll pick up from this when we go, but I need to, I need, I need, te- I need 10 more. I, I traveled from Singapore. It's 13 hours. <laughs> I've suffered, your own is not much. Uh, 13 hours. In 48 hours, I traveled 26 hours. And I'm standing. So you cannot say you are tired. <laughs> All right, Psalm 25, please, 10 minutes. Because if I, if I, if I, 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 I have so much, you know, in the next session, I won't crack jokes. We'll just be saying it. Right. <laughs> Psalm 25. Psalm 25. If, you don't, if people don't laugh, the thing doesn't get it. It's the truth. It's true. yes. You don't know. If you don't laugh, it doesn't get it. All right, it's just the intellectual. Because you have to do subconscious reprogramming. And joy is the key to that part. You, you understand what I'm saying? Yes, I mean, there, there was a man, John Gillick, he said he was praying for somebody, praying for somebody, and the healing power would go in and come back. It would go in and come back. He said there's what they call the human clutch, that you can hold on to your problem so much that God can't get it out of your hand. Mentally, you are holding on to it, which means that you are thinking more about the debt than about being free of the debt. And to that which you have, more shall be given. So, if no, 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 this is a principle, I'm not joking, all right? What you hold on to is what will multiply. Yes. That's why I said the person that is in debt, he's not holding to it. He's, he's, listen to this, it's not that they are careless. I said this last time I came here, I think I said it. I said, listen, I saw this, I saw it inside a book, Evangelical, written by healing, the healing, uh, divine health evangelists that didn't believe in healing. Of Pentecostal, they say we believe in health. What do we believe in? That my, my people should live in permanent health. They said the first reason why people fall ill is stress that comes as a result of doing things too close to the time of that thing. They put themselves under too much pressure. Do you know I was watching TED Talk and I heard a man say, People who come late live longer. <laughs> because the person who comes late, He's not worried. When he gets there, he says, what happened? There was hope. <laughs> the man who's coming, oh, we must get there. Hey, what do you want me to do? The train stopped. The train stopped. He lives on. He doesn't stress himself. I'm not giving him the job. Hey, that's your problem. I'll go and look for another job. He doesn't have stress. All right, let's go back. It's okay then. So all the parts. So what you hold on, so John Gillick said, this one was holding on so much to it that he knew that the power couldn't go in until he released it. So he cracked a joke. 
while the man was laughing, he laid hands. The thing went. By the time he came back, he was healed. So laughter releases. Are, are you following me? Yes, That's why in a church, it, it shouldn't be in a church service too much serious, deep worship. Because that person that is worshiping can be crying about their problem. <laughs> you have to have joy. It's healing. A Mary had doet good. People have to leave the service light. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, uh, oh, now it looks good. Uh, <laughs> oh, this is, and I might get a point. Uh, I grow, you know? Then they leave the place. Everybody's. You need joy. Don't forget that family. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All the parts. Psalm 25, verse 10. All the paths, all right, of the Lord, all. He didn't say some. Psalm 25, verse 10. All the paths. He didn't say some. He, didn't, he said all. Psalm 25, verse 10. He says all. All God's paths are mercy. All the paths of the Lord are what? Mercy. He didn't say some. All. That means he shows mercy, but in showing mercy, there is truth. All right, our mercy and truth shall us keep his covenant. Now, so what are we saying here? When you come up quickly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy, you pray what is found in Isaiah 55. Let me give an example here, verse 6. Isaiah 55, verse 6. Put up the says, Seek the Lord while he may be found, and call upon him while he is there. Now, we understand this. Seek the Lord while he may be found, which means that is time sensitive now. Huh? And it's because people don't pray this prayer. I'm trying to tell you. This is what causes the problem. Call upon him while he's what? Near. Look at what he says. Let the unrighteous, all right, next verse. It says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous his thoughts. Let him return. In other words, when you're coming to him, you're saying, God, there's something wrong with my thoughts and there's something wrong with the ways in which I'm doing things. I present myself before you. Whatever is wrong about my own, do you understand what I say here? And my way of doing it, it is now time to do what? Reveal it to me. Then you will know his presence. He says, let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy and he will abundantly pardon. For, he goes on, he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my, except you are saying you are as intelligent as God. Neither are my ways your ways, said Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Then he says, as the rain comes down from heaven, in other words, when you go up to him and say, Lord, I forsake my thoughts and my ways here. Now I want you to teach me that which I know not teach me. I present, I am sure that this promise you have given, you will fulfill. That is not in doubt. The only hindrance can be found inside me. Do you get what we're saying here? Now, repeat them. And then when you begin to pray, it says, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. In other words, when you offer that kind of prayer to him, it says, then the revelation begins to come. Then light begins to come. Then you will see that the very things, all right, that you resisted, or the very things that you even were not, those are the things. You, look, as I am now, to be honest, to, to, to be very honest with you. Now, listen, this, let me say this on sincerity. If God blesses you, you have more opportunities than you can use. So you have to be a distributor of opportunities. See, I went to Singapore, he's my friend. He told me you are coming to speak. I said I can't. This is a meeting where the Asian Alliance of Evangelicals are which means, is your, the, in fact, he called us for a private meeting to meet all his friends. You will see head of this in Brazil, head of that in Brazil. I mean, it's a time to network. My mind is not, it's not, you know, it's, it was time for me to speak. Listen, I was coming to Command of Faith Seminar. That was more important to me. I didn't have to tell them, because I told them, told them, it looked like they were not hearing. I was telling them from Nigeria that I can't, but, they, but when we arrived there, they said, you see, your session is this. If that session, I did that session, I'll be landing. In fact, I changed the flight. I realized that I will land at 6 a.m. this morning. I, I had to look at it and say, what did I do here? So I changed it back. 
So I said, where are your questions? I wrote an answer. I gave it to Sopa. I said, go and answer the question. He is the one that had global something. Are you following what I'm saying? You have to be in that position. You can't say, I will hold on to Singapore. And hold. Do you get what I'm saying? God can bless you when, when you know. So he has to walk on the inside. I, I mean, I told someone, I said, I said, someone, I said, let me tell you this. Listen, what I've learned in the last one year, I will confidently tell you. Listen, I was walking, I was, I was walking in foolishness. First 12 years of ministry. Listen, I was walking in the anointing of foolishness. <laughs> and may it be that in two years, I will come back and say, two years ago, I was walking <laughs> in the anointing of foolishness. Because when you grow, what was right becomes wrong. When I was a child, I taught as a child. Except you are not growing. I preached a message once. It's either you are right or successful. You can't be both. We are not here to win arguments. No. We are here to win in life. Yes. So you go to him. That which I see not, teach thou me. This thing I am certain. You win this sin. The question is not on your part. Let God be true. Every man is a liar. Show me. The areas there, that's the prayer. And then God begins to open your eyes. See, see what he said here. Psalm 32 and verse, let me just quickly show this. That's why, that's why John said, if you say you have no sin, you lie. That means you are, you are Jesus. That's why in an argument, when say, who is right? Uh, a couple is fighting. Both of them are wrong. God is right. There's no need for peace meeting. What's the solution? If every time you talk, you fight, don't talk to yourself again. You say, when you're in the same room, we argue. Don't stay in the same room. Let me tell you what to do. You stay in that room. I stay in this room. Then we'll give you confessions. <laughs> I love my wife just as Jesus. Why are you separated though? As Jesus loves the church. Now be making these confessions. And anything that I'm doing that is wrong, not what the wife is doing that is wrong. And the wife don't say what the husband is doing that is wrong. You'll be confessing, he loves me just, and I love him just. And don't talk to yourselves, though. Don't talk to yourselves. Don't even greet yourself, because the greeting can cause problems. Just be <laughs> making the confession. I know what I'm talking about. And there's any area where I'm wrong. Lord, open my eyes that I may see. Not that the person is wrong, that I am wrong. One day, you go out. And this is where God will show you. You'll be sitting with your friends. Ah, this auntie, she was fighting. They don't know what you're doing. You know, she used to, it would look like they're reading your meal. God, you say, have you seen it? Have you seen the problem? No. It won't be deep. Do you get what I'm saying? Have you seen the problem? Yes. The man, too, will be somewhere. He's trying to just say, you know, I was struggling in business. Something was happening. Ah, I realized I used to treat my wife like this. Eh? You know anything that affects a man's economy will re -brain, brain reset. <laughs> the brain will reset. Just tell him that you won't make it. With that. His brain will change. And then says, every time I give to my... Listen, and it's true. This is one is true. This one is true. As a man, the highest reward on your giving is what you give your wife. This one I know from heaven. Do you understand what I am saying? Yes, sir. Uh, listen. You don't understand. The, listen. Listen what I'm saying here. When you give, all right? When you give, okay? Because there are some people who the anointing is outside they give, inside they don't. But that's not our message. Let's <laughs> go to the, so, Psalm 32. <laughs> ah, 
Some has disappeared from my back. <laughs> People don't want. What's going on here? Oh, the Bible has gone on reverse. Oh, it's alphabetic. Okay, you know. Okay, it happened to you, Psalm 32. All right. Remember, verse, verse 2. Now, this, this is where Paul got the teaching on faith from. Verse 2, Psalm 32, verse 2. Blessed is the man in whom the Lord imputed on iniquity, in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silent, my bones... Now, why is in spirit there is no guile? Because when I kept silent, my bones waxed old through my roaring day long, all day long. Verse 4. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is torn the drought of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin. My iniquity have I not heed. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and thou forgivest the iniquity of my sin. For this shall everyone that is what? Godly. Not ungodly. Pray unto thee in a time where thou mayest be found. Surely the floods of great waters, they shall not come near him. He says, I will do what? Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve for trouble. I will do what? Instruct thee. I will teach you. So you go to him in prayer and say, Lord, I want to find you now. What I am doing that I don't know that is wrong. The way in which I'm going about this business that is not right, this farm, whatever it is, open my eyes. And when you pray in that particular way, then, you know, the scripture says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. That regard iniquity doesn't mean I'm saying I'm doing something wrong. No, this is what he's talking about. And I'll close with it. That if you hold it, if you, if you go to God in prayer without you admitting, that the fault might lie inside you. He said, God, we hear that prayer. That's what he's talking about. This is what the hindrance is. God didn't say, go and correct yourself. He said, come, let us reason together. He says, bring it. I will show you where the issue is. I didn't say, go and figure it out yourself. I will show you. And when you change it, the thing becomes a flow. All right? He says, I will teach. So you present yourself before God in worship and praise and say, God, this thing you have said is certain. In 12 months, I will be here. Set the goal. That's what I said. 12 months, I'll be here. 12 months. But whatever will hinder me from being there, show me. That is the issue. And then you go and pray. Open my eyes. Let me see it. God can show you direct revelation from Scripture. Somebody can come to talk to you. You can learn it from anywhere. Even ants. But she will show you. And you say, that is it. That's why he says, turn at my reproof and I will pour my spirit upon thee. He says, the Redeemer shall come to Zion, to them that turn from the transgression that is in Jacob. He says, as for me, this is my covenant with you. My word will I put on your lips. Before your words will begin to have that impact, he said, there's something you must turn away from. I'll continue. Let's just read next session. I want to go into another aspect. I think we have, we've tried with this one. Eh? Second aspect of it. So go to God with all confidence. Job 36, and this is what we're saying from verse 8. If they be bound in fetters and holding in cords of affliction, now, you must remember, I'm telling you, it's not what you are doing consciously, it's what you don't know that is wrong. A lady had not been promoted in church for five years. She went for one of the community groups meeting. In the community groups, somebody who was a very senior person, banker in the church, right, was teaching on how to manage, which means you get to a certain stage, this is how you manage your bosses. After he finished, she said she realized something, where the error was. She said she just saw something. She, she, said, she said, I went back to work on Monday and I did something as he had shared, the adjustment. He said, the boss turned around and says, where have you been in five years? He said, this is the person I was looking for. He wrote the promotion. It, by the time she came back next week, she had gotten promotion. Five years of stagnancy. If she didn't get that information, things don't change with time. They change with truth. You shall know the truth. Do you people say? 
So he says this. If they be bound with fetters of a cure, then he showed them their work, their transgressions that they have exceeded. He opened their ear to discipline and commanded the return from iniquity. If they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in what? Pleasure. Now listen to what he said next to show his ignorance. But if they obey not, they shall perish by the sword and they shall die without knowledge. That means they didn't know. My people perish for lack of what? Knowledge. That's what he's talking about. What's making Christians not move as far as they should in, the in commerce and world of commerce and do that? Knowledge. In fact, I am telling you that majority of the problem is the way people have taught the Bible to people. God shall supply all my needs according to riches and glory. Then the person sits down and is waiting for God to supply their need. It will never come. Listen to what I'm saying. Nobody's coming to give you anything from anywhere. Nobody. Nobody. If you ever hear testimony, I gave something, and then someone came, I gave it. Listen to me. Just discard it from your mind. Because if you're waiting for that to happen, you wait forever. You are not a preacher. That's Levitical priesthood. Do you get what I'm saying? People will come and preach and share the testimony of preacher to people that are not preachers. They're not a preacher. I say, I'm waiting. They'll come and give me tires to my car. Wait, wait, you, you will wait. <laughs> See, listen, something about scripture is this. Check what a person teaches. Check what they're living. You'll find out what you heard when they taught contradicts what they're doing. Check it. You'll be shocked. Because what you heard is not what. Paul said, my God shall supply you need a contribution to glory my treasure. Paul, now told them. I've coveted no man's silver or gold. You have seen how these hands have ministered to my necessity. Walk. I say, by the favor of God, I'll be promoted. Show me one person inside the Bible that God authorized promotion that did not outperform everybody. One person. I say, we are daft. But God just said, He just said, my son, my daughter. You are next in line. Next what? <laughs> you know people don't understand things. They say, when you try to tell Christians, they'll be angry. You'll say, uh, listen to me, grace will make it happen. Grace will make it happen. Okay, this grace is saying you don't understand what they're talking about. No, grace will make it happen. Grace will make it happen. By the grace of God. Okay. Let's go to Heathrow Airport. We'll sit down. Let's body play. Someone just comes in and just walks. Are you the pilot? Yes. Where do you go to flying school? I oh, know, I didn't. What do you do for a living? I'm a carpenter. So what's going to happen? Uh, by the grace of God, we'll get there. <laughs> Enter the plane, huh? He said, I'm telling you, by the grace of God, we'll get there. You will not enter. Uh, you take someone to hospital. They say, well, uh, say let's operate. How? Uh, don't worry. Are you a doctor? Uh, no. Just bring the knife. By, by the grace of God. You will not. So why are you now using that statement on other aspects of your life. In fact, when somebody, when you tell somebody, to be, I will be here at 3 o'clock and says, I'll be there by the grace of God, what he's telling you is I will not be there. <laughs> and when you don't see me, blame God. <laughs> Let's close with saying this here. So, it says, they die, but hypocrites, now I want you to see this, in heart, heap up wrath, they cry not when he bindeth them. They die in their youth, their life is among the unclean. He delivered the poor in his affliction. How does he do it? By opening his ears. That's how he, you get it? He opens your ears in oppression. So he would have removed thee out of the street into a broad place where there's no straightness, and that which have been set on your table would have been full of what? Fatness. So when you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death and he's comforting you with his what? Rod and staff. That rod is a rod of correction. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah? To put, so that table he has prepared for you in the presence of your enemies, you are corrected to that place. Are you following me? Now, I won't get here. But thou hast fulfilled the judgment of the wicked. Judgment and justice take hold on thee because you refuse. Because there is wrath, beware, lest he take thee away with his stroke, and a great ransom can deliver thee. Which means just pray, show me, instead of all this. He says, will he esteem thy riches? No, not gold, nor fossil strength. You can't give your way out of what you should hear. 
Look what it says. Desire not the night when people are caught out of their place. This is why people lose their place. Look at what it says. Take heed. Regard not iniquity. That's what he's talking about. Which means you are holding on without opening your heart for change. If I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not do what? Hear me. In other words, when I say, God, deliver me, I'm saying, open my ears. That's what David came to know. He says, my ears has thou opened. He says, all these things we are doing, burnt offering, God doesn't need these things. That's how David got out. He says, how will you get out? He says, praise. He has put a new song in my mouth. And that was why David had audacity. I mean, Moses, and that's what happens during crisis. We'll, we'll talk about that. In crisis, that's where you get, that's where you hear God. That's why Job said, I heard of thee with the hand of my head. Now, I have seen you. In that place is where you know God for yourself. Because he will teach you. David came and said, listen, Moses put this tabernacle. What did Moses say? He said, God told me, build according to the pattern I showed you. So this is the pattern God showed you. He said, yes. David came and said, God has opened my ears. This one is doing here. It's not right. How dare you say Moses? You are saying Moses was dead. You. Who are you? He went to set up his own. There was no holy stuff where anybody can enter. Moses old, female could enter. He says this one. There's nothing like this. God doesn't discriminate. Women can come in. That one, lame people. He said lame people can come in. Open it. Anybody should go in. The ark is there. Nobody died. Moses old. Even the high priest risked himself. <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying? There are levels in Revelation. What was right 10 years ago may not be right for you again. So it's not that you're consciously sinning. It's that you are ignorant of what it requires. Father, we thank you for your word and by the power of your spirit, we ask that you establish us in this truth and cause it to expand within our consciousness. In Jesus' name, amen. Take off from this second session. Thank you. Thank you.